Live from the Austin Convention Center in Austin, Texas, it's The Cube at Dell World 2014. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Hi, we're back to wrap up Dell World. Stu Miniman and I have been here all day. We'll be here tomorrow as well. We're starting at 8.30 local time, 9.30 East Coast time tomorrow. Uh, getting started early. Uh, Michael Dell will be on tomorrow. We'll have the keynotes again. Uh, we're only broadcasting for a, a half day. But so today, Stu, um, I want to get your take on this. A lot of talk, of course, initiated by me and others about Dell as a private company. Um, I think it's a two-edged sword, frankly, because I think that when things are really good and you got a lot of momentum behind you, you've got transparent confirmation or quasi-transparent confirmation and that creates a lot of buzz and buzz begets buzz and that can, some good things, some flywheel effects can occur from being public at the same time when things aren't so great and the headlines are bad and the earnings aren't great, it, you can go into this uh, vortex, this abyss, which Dell was kind of there and I think, as you were talking about with Matt Eastwood, the timing of Dell going private couldn't have been better from a valuation standpoint for Michael Dell and, and, and Silver Lake. I mean, I, I think they got a fantastic deal, even though there's a lot of risk in it that they're taking, but the fact that Michael Dell's willing to step up and do that, now owns 75% of the company. Yes, they have debt service. What is it, $18 billion in, in, in debt, so I, think, I think was the number. But they'll pay that off over time because of the cash flow machine. And um, they're going to be in a really good position when that happens. Yeah, yeah, Dave, it's real interesting. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of change at Dell. Uh, there's been, uh, there's a lot of new faces here, and some of the ones that we knew for many years are gone. And you really are having that transformation inside. Uh, I heard one person, kind of the overheard in the hallway type thing is, you know, there were certain antibodies in Dell, and you know, they're kind of sweeping through making changes, and if there's some that aren't on board with where it's going, you know, well, maybe they'll need to take, I guess it was the voluntary exit uh, type solution. They're out. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but they're hiring aggressively in other spaces because yep. IT is changing um, and for me the real striking thing uh, Dave is Dell talked a lot about choice and we say you know there's so many different markets out there there's you know VMware in their ecosystem there's what Microsoft's doing there's the public cloud and there's all of these little you know sub climates uh, inside IT and Dell's playing a lot of bets which we, we talked about is how many bets can you place and actually make enough margin and win at what you're doing. So since Dell doesn't have to answer to Wall Street, uh, they can do what they think is best uh, for the company and really for the customers. It kept coming back to you know, Michael and all the executives saying we're focused on what the customers are asking us to do. We can move really fast. We've definitely seen examples of uh, Dell moving faster to deliver some of these solutions uh, th than, than they had when they were a public company. Things like the cloud marketplace, things like the Nutanix OEM, uh, you know, so a lot of interesting technologies here. Uh, and there's still lots of hardware, uh, Dave. You know, I'm looking through the Twitter stream and everybody's snapping pictures of the new FX2, uh, kind of the next generation Vertex. It went from Vertex really being that remote office box to the FX2 really being a data center, you know, nice hardware platform uh, that, that you can build for a more scalable environment. So, uh, you know, interesting stuff happening. Always a good vibe here in Austin. Uh, um, I think that one of the other things that's interesting to me, in, in a way, when I think, I think of, I'm reminded of Lou Gerstner's, you know, can, uh, who says elephants can't dance. In a way, Michael Dell is orchestrating a, a different version, clear differences of that playbook. And here's what I mean by that. He took a company that was 100% essentially PCs and began a, a multi-billion dollar buying spree and transformed this company into what is now the only end-to-end -end enterprise company. Now, HP used to talk about that as a big deal. They've given up on that now that they're going to split up. What is the value to a customer of end-to-end? -end? One is, is supply chain. Why does a customer care about supply chain? Because it gives uh, Dell pricing power. So Dell's got potentially one of the biggest supply chains now in the industry. HP had a supply chain that was enormous. Uh, but now when they split it up, I don't know how they're going to continue to leverage that. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. It sounds like they won't be able to have that same leverage. IBM, when it sold its PC division to Lenovo, lost a lot of leverage. 
Dell is now able to, <laughs> to claim number one in storage, terabyte shipped. Why? Because it ships so many PCs. Um, it's not because of the server business, it's because every PC goes out with a half a terabyte disk drive in it. So add it up and Dell kicks butt. All of a sudden, boom, number one. So that's interesting. But from a customer standpoint, you can buy virtually anything from the company. Now, I talked about sort of can elephant stance. You're seeing that transformation being led by a number of factors. Certainly servers is a big part of that, and networking and storage with the, the big acquisitions that they've made, and networking with the acquisitions that they made, but also Perot. Dell's got a big services organization that's very sticky. And then the other thing, which not a lot of people talk about, is Dell software. In fact, I got a tweet earlier from somebody saying, Dell, I presume, uh, Dave, I presume when you talk about Dell having one of everything, you're not including software. Well, as we know, Dell's got a, almost a $2 billion software business. Now that's not ridiculously enormous, but it, it's substantial. How many, how many multi-billion dollar software companies are out there? So what I see is this big portfolio, it's not, I wouldn't say it's services led, it's not. It's, it's Dell led, um, but there's a ser sticky services component with an increasing software component in growth areas like security, like systems management, like so what Dell calls information management, which is a lot of the analytics and big data. So Dell can continue, if Dell can continue to make those acquisitions, do the integrations, it's got a pretty good story for customers, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely, Dave. And there's still, it's that PC business and that server business that's generating the cash and, and allowing them to get into a lot of environments and trying out a lot of pieces. Uh, you know, the cloud broker model is really interesting uh, because we talked about it a couple of years ago and clouds are not homogenous and it's not, you know, until recently, moving from one environment to another was going to be difficult. Enter things like uh, Docker and uh, management tools like the Instratius acquisition that Dell made are enabling some of these multi-cloud environments. Uh, and so we're seeing customers, you know, from what we see, aren't going all in with one environment. Uh, you know, we, we've got a survey going on right now, uh, and some of the data we've seen uh, so far is that, you know, it's not like they're saying, oh, I've got Amazon and I'm only doing Amazon. Most customers, they're doing Amazon, they, they've got VMware inside, uh, they might be doing something with Azure because everybody's got Office 365, and of course they've got lots of SaaS applications. So, you know, where does Dell fit into this environment, and can they be, you know, a broker, a supplier, an arms dealer uh, for a lot of these pieces, and you know, how do they tie them all together? How do they grow those services? How do they add their software? You said, you know, that there's pieces of software they don't have. They don't have, you know, 200 SaaS applications like IBM does. They don't have the breadth of the Amazon marketplace today. But, you know, Dell is in a lot of customer environments, especially in that, you know, kind of sub 5,000 user, uh, you know, marketplace. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for Dell so, to add on to that. And, and, like I said before, they can craft a story because they're not a public company that is very positive. You know, every CEO that is a CEO of a public company, when he or she comes on the earnings call, even if they have a miss, even if they have a, a quarter that they're disappointed in, they spin a story and, and the street then starts opening up the books and parsing the numbers and, and doing the analysis and the street either buys it or they don't. Um, and so what Dell can do is they can craft any story that they want and make it sound great. And, and create their own momentum. Now, it sounds like they're growing, but you know, even today in the keynotes, you got a little mix of units and dollars and terabytes and geographies and, and different segments and so forth, but Michael Dell was able to, to very effectively put together a story of growth that's been mirrored by his executive management team, um, and I have no doubt that there's, there's growth segments, but you know, think about it. If, IBM were a private company, they could talk about cloud, they could talk about their software defined stuff, they could talk about you know, the security businesses, those businesses that are growing, and not talk about the businesses that are shrinking, and not talk about the top line that's flat to down, or whatever it is. So, so Dell has that advantage in that they can craft a story and, and, and use that in their marketing to be relevant, and I think that's really what customers want to know. They want to know that, the company I'm doing business with is relevant. So they got PCs as the tip of the spear. Everybody knows Dell PCs, easy to do business with, no problem. They've got the services piece that's sticky and they've got everything else in between, which is this end-to-end -end strategy for mid-sized and, and smaller enterprises, which really 
everybody else kind of poo poo not poo poos they all they give it lip service this is this is where Dell really shines and so I don't know, Stu, it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, Dave, it's interesting. I was just ruminating on, on the fact that, you know, when you think about the early PC days, Dell just made it so easy to buy. First with the catalog and then with the website, I could go in and click and, 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 and choose the environments that I wanted. If we look at converged infrastructure and cloud, which is where the, the growth really is, you know, can Dell take those same type of experiences and move those to the environments and make you know, those choices. Uh, you know, the, the cloud marketplace reminds me a lot of the Dell S&P, which was really the offering that I could buy almost anything from Dell. Uh, and Dell would take a, you know, a cut even if it's a small one, and they didn't necessarily have to support it. Hugely successful, drove a ton of revenue for Dell. Uh, so, you know, lots of things that they can, uh, you know, t take advantage of. Well, and like I say, when, when Dell was, was public, they were a roughly sixty billion dollar company with with you know trading at fifty to sixty cents on the dollar. Michael Dell to, and, and Silver Lake having taken that private, the ultimate measure, yes, customer value, et cetera, et cetera. But the real leaderboard is going to be when, if and when Dell decides to have another exit, whether that's a public offering or whatever. What the thing to watch is, will Dell have been able to shift its business mix toward the enterprise so that it can even trade, let's say, at one to one? If if so, it can it could it could create thirty billion dollars of value. You know that, that Michael owns seventy five percent of. So to me, it was just a brilliant move. Uh, this this company is still a cash flow machine. You know these big companies that that aren't growing that Wall Street seems to hate for some reason. Even Core EMC, these are cash flow machines. Oracle, cash flow machine. IBM, HP, cash flow machines that if they have good leadership, they can transform their businesses into a success story. All right, we're getting kicked out of here, Stu. Uh, look tomorrow, we start at 8.30 a.m. The Cube will be live, siliconangle.tv. Check out wikibon.org. Check out siliconangle.com for all the news. We'll see you tomorrow. This is The Cube, Stu Miniman, Dave Vellante. We're out, see you tomorrow.